Well, good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick note, the homework from last time is up here at the front, so please don't forget to pick up your work. Um, as far as the grading on it, uh, I think the biggest error was that several students solved the first problem using the psychometric chart, but that problem was part of the material from the book before we even started talking about the psychometric chart, so you really weren't allowed to use a psych chart in that first problem. Um, nonetheless, uh, pretty much everybody got the problems right. The last two problems, the psych chart problems, pretty much everybody got those right. So I really don't have any comments regarding that. Nonetheless, um, again a reminder that next Monday is a holiday. Um, next Wednesday is really our last class meeting where we're going to be covering any new material. And then next Friday will be review, question and answer period, uh, teacher evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just get back to where we were last time, which is talking about the wet cooling tower. Okay. So hopefully we recall that when we're dealing with a cooling tower, we actually have two different streams that we're dealing with. Um, we've got a water stream that is essentially dribbling down through the cooling tower. And then we have an air stream which is flowing up through the cooling tower. And as these two streams come into physical contact with one another, um, you know, heat transfer takes place. Um, and evaporation takes place. Um, the water is going to be uh, warmer than the air. Um, the air is going to allow the water to cool as it comes into contact. But also because of the evaporation of water into that air, we have more heat transfer associated with uh, well, what we call latent heat transfer, which is just associated with the evaporation of the water into that air. So this is what we talked about last time. Um, let's just put the same numbering scheme here on the board. Uh, one and two represents the air going in and out, and three and four represents the water. Um, we understand that cooling towers are used in industry a lot. Um, I mean, they're, they're absolutely everywhere. Uh, I know I mentioned this last time. Maybe some of you have started to look around and you begin to see them. Uh, probably the one that's most visible on campus is that there's a big one right on top of the CLA building. It's actually not used anymore. Um, but if you're on a high enough spot like the top of this building, just look over to the CLA and you'll see a cooling tower on top. Um, the biggest ones, of course, on campus are at the central chiller plant up on top of the hill. Um, all of you are just welcome to walk up there. I mean, it's public space, so if you want to see what some cooling towers look like, just go through, what is it, lot J, keep going, can't miss it. Um, so, nonetheless. Cooling towers are used for cooling purposes. We have water that's picking up heat from some condenser somewhere, right? It's picking up either heat from the condenser in a steam power plant or it's picking up heat from the condenser in a refrigeration cycle. Um, that heat is then rejected somewhere, which is into the airstream. So the water from your process, from your condenser, is going to go into the cooling tower and that's the basic process that we're talking about here for the wet cooling towers. Now, last time we already looked at the mass balance equations. So just to summarize, we know that the dry air mass flow rate is going to be constant. So we'll just call this m dot a. Um, and we also saw that the amount of water that was lost by evaporation, um, you know, if we compare the water in to the water that drips out, um, there will be definitely a loss due to the evaporation. And this has to be equal to the amount of water that's picked up by the airstream. So this is just going to be the difference between the water vapor at 1 and 2, which is just the air mass flow rate, times the difference between omega at 1 and 2. So this is just m dot a times omega 2 minus omega 1. Okay. Um, so these are the mass balance equations, again, for air and water. Um, and then also let's keep in mind that this amount of water that's evaporating has to be made up for. This is an important parameter that we're calculating. This is the mass flow rate of evaporation. Um, and of course, we need to have a makeup water supply. So typically, we just call this m dot makeup. 
So this is the makeup water that we have to provide for. And again, this could be millions of gallons a day. So this is the mass balance we started with last time, or that we saw last time. Um, let's now look at the energy balance. Okay. So the energy balance is just like any other energy balance that we've done. Um, I will note that in this particular case, uh, we typically would not be losing any significant amount of heat into the surroundings. Um, you know, often these are insulated. So, um, you know, there's not going to be any heat transfer. And like all problems we've seen, you know, there's no kinetic or potential energy changes. Um, cooling tower is a very passive device, right? There's just water dropping and air flowing. There's, there's no work devices here. So uh, there's no work. So basically our first law just becomes the sum over all inlets of m dot i h i equals the sum over all exits of m dot e h e. Okay, so this is our first law, right? Our, our energy balance. And now it's just a matter of realizing that there's two streams going in and two streams going out. So we would have our dry air stream, um, m dot a h 1. Um, then we would have our water coming in at point 3, so just m dot 3h3. Um, and then this has to equal what goes out. So the energy that goes out, we've got m dot a h2. That's the air that goes out. And then we also have the water that goes out, so plus m dot 4h4. Um, please note that even though the dry air mass flow rate is the same going both in and out of this cooling tower, the water flow rate certainly is not, right? Um, m dot 3 has to be greater than m dot 4 because there's evaporation taking place. We're, we're losing water as we go from 3 to 4. So please don't make that mistake. Um, so now what we should do is just rearrange this equation and manipulate it in a way that gives us the results we're looking for. So the first thing I just want to do is, is plug this equation in to above. So plug in from above. OK, and we're specifically going to put it into the m dot 4 term right in here. OK, and then I'll get the following. So we have m dot h1 plus m dot 3h3 three equals. Um, and then we still have the air term, m dot h2. Uh, but now we have this m dot 4 term. Um, we could just rearrange the well, the mass balance for the water. So m dot 4 is just going to be m dot 3 minus m dot a omega 2 minus omega 1. So we put that in here, m dot 3 minus m dot a omega 2 minus omega 1, and then times h4. Um, this too can be rearranged. Let's just collect all the terms that have the air mass flow rate together. So we have m dot a. And then we have an h2 minus h1, um, and then minus omega 2 minus omega 1, h4. So those are the terms that have the air mass flow rate attached to them. Um, and then lastly, we have all the other terms on the right-hand side. So this is just going to be equals. And this will have, what, an m dot 3 and an h4, and then an m dot 3 and an h3. So m dot 3 times h3 minus h4. Okay, And in doing so, I move some of the terms from the right-hand side to the left-hand side as negatives, and some of the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And the signs are hopefully correct in this particular equation. And now that we've written in this form, we'll finish this by solving for the air mass flow rate. So that's just m dot 3, h3 minus h4. And then just divided by this big term in the square brackets. So h2 minus h1, and then minus omega 2 minus omega 1 h4. All right. So this equation and this equation really become the two important equations that we need to deal with. All right. Now, why are they important? Well, Again, we know that we have to provide an appropriate amount of makeup water, which could be huge, so certainly that's important. But also, we need to size the fan that's blowing the air across this particular cooling tower. I mean, granted, the fan doesn't appear within 
our control volume. The fan's going to be up above somewhere. Um, but still, we need to size that fan. We need to provide a fan that's large enough that has the appropriate mass flow rate to satisfy this particular equation. So, you know, that's the purpose of these calculations. So, I guess what I should do now is just go through an example problem, and hopefully this will help bring everything together. And let me, uh, well, I need to pull the screen down. Uh, hopefully you've all written very quickly. Um, today. Okay. Um, really, the first thing that I want to do is just show you some photographs of cooling towers. So let's let that thing warm up briefly. Uh, I mean, I just went to Google here this morning. It's not like I'm doing anything special. Well, you know, let me just lower this a little bit, and then I'll raise it back up again. Um, anyway, I just did this right before I came to class. Um, you know, that big diagram on the left, I mean, that's one of those massive cooling towers I mentioned before. Um, you might notice that, you know, all this in here, um, that's just what we would call the packing or the fill. Um, that's just going to be some wooden baffles or some sort of waveform of some sort. And all those housings that are up there at the top, those are the fans. Um, one fan just isn't going to cut it for many cooling towers, so they're divided into multiple cells. Um, you could have a dozen, you could have two dozen fans on a particular cooling tower. So that, that's just an example of one of these cooling towers, and certainly they're not all that big. Um, well, let's find another image here. Um, I had mentioned last time how the world is afraid of cooling towers. Uh, th those are just the stacks of a cooling tower that we would call a natural draft cooling tower. So instead of a fan, you would just put these massive stacks on top of the cooling tower. In fact, the cooling tower is so small compared to these giant stacks, you can't even see the cooling tower itself. They're just kind of buried or hidden in there. Um, now there's another example, but not great. Uh, this is a stack that's under construction. Um, the actual cooling tower is down here where the cursor is. That's where the air is going to flow in. And this is just the bottom half or third or so of a seven or 800 foot high tower that's going to naturally allow the air to move through this thing. So we're talking about some absolutely massive devices, but, but they don't have to be massive. I mean, some of them are a little bit smaller. Um, I mean, here's just an example of a small cooling tower. That's the kind you would typically see on a building, um, you know, used to reject the heat from the condenser of your air conditioning unit, your refrigeration cycle, if you will. Um, anyway, cooling towers. Here's the example problem that we're going to look at. And again, I want to try to, I can't exactly see it. Hmm. All right, well, that's about as big as it's going to get. Um, so let me read it to you at the same time as you're looking at this. Um, first of all, this is problem 14-109 from your current edition of the textbook. And there's your cooling tower. It says we have a wet cooling tower, and it's to cool 60 kilograms per second of water from 40 down to 33 degrees Celsius. Um, the atmospheric air enters at one atmosphere, and it gives dry and wet bulb temperatures of 22 and 16, respectively. Um, and it says that the air leaves at 30 degrees Celsius with a relative humidity of 95%. Um, this is not unusual. Um, the air has a whole lot of water evaporating into it, so it's not unusual for the discharge to be you know, close to saturated. It could even be completely saturated. Here we're only at 95% relative humidity, but that's pretty close to being saturated. Um, anyway, we're trying to find the volumetric flow rate of the air that goes into the tower and the mass flow rate of the makeup water that's required. Okay, So these are the kind of things that I just mentioned we were interested in. I mean, this asks for the volumetric flow rate of air rather than the mass flow rate of air. But honestly, they're related, right? The volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume is the mass flow rate. So um, this is what we're trying to find. And of course, we can look up specific volume data on our psychrometric chart. 
So that's the problem we're looking at. Um, let me just write down the data that's given. And I'm going to use exactly the same numbering scheme that I've shown over here on the board. So we know that the water flow rate um, is 60 kilograms per second. So that's the water that flows in. So m.3 is 60 kilograms per second. Um, we're given the temperature of the water in and out, right? So that's points three and four. So T3 and T4 are given as 40 and 33 degrees Celsius. So those are given to us. And certainly the water temperature is going to cool, right? I mean, it is a cooling tower, so it's going to cool by a number of degrees. Um, we're also given the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. Um, we also know the wet and the dry bulb temperatures of the air coming in. So that's point 0.1. So the dry bulb and the wet bulb at 1 are both given. So these are 22 and 16 degrees Celsius, respectively. Um, and then it tells us that the air leaves, which would be at state point 0.2, um, at 30 degrees C with a relative humidity of 0.95. It okay. says so use the psych chart, find the volumetric flow rate of the air into the tower. So we want V dot of the air in, so that's 0.1, right? So V dot 1 is unknown, and we're trying to find the makeup. Okay. So this is our problem that's been given. Um, now, we have all the data we need, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the equations, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lift the screen up um, because I want to make sure we can see the equations. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll just do it that way. Um, Clearly, this isn't going to be super easy to read, but at least everything is up there now. All right, so we look at the various equations. We know that to find the volumetric flow rate, I'm sorry, to find, yes, we, need, <laughs> we know that to find the volumetric flow rate, we need to relate the mass flow rate to the volumetric flow rate. And since we're interested in the volumetric flow rate at 1, then we better use a specific volume at 1. And we know that even though the volumetric flow rate is for the air-water vapor mixture, the specific volume is on a per unit mass of dry air basis. So this is you know, cubic meters of the mixture per pound of dry air. So this is actually giving us the dry air mass flow rate. So in other words, V dot 1 is just the specific volume times M dot A. Um, and then, of course, as far as finding the makeup water, it's really just a matter of finding well, the difference between m.3 and m.4, or knowing the air mass flow rate, just finding omega-1 and omega-2. So we have all the properties we need, right? We have the wet and the dry bulb temperature of the air at the inlet. So state 1 is known. Go into the psych chart, get whatever data we need. Uh, we also know the temperature and relative humidity at the air discharge from the cooling tower. So again, we can go into our psych chart and get whatever we need. Um, now, as far as the temperature at 3 and 4, of course, we're going to need enthalpy data at 3 and 4. Um, technically, water that's in our atmosphere is always compressed liquid water. I mean, at standard atmospheric pressure, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius is the saturation temperature. Our temperatures are all much less than that. Um, so clearly, we're dealing with compressed liquid water. But as usual, we don't have good compressed liquid water data in our book. Um, so we have no choice but to just say, well, that's OK, because we know that saturated liquid at the same temperature as a compressed liquid water gives you the same value of the thermodynamic properties, right? So we just use HF at points 3 and 4. And this is very, very close to the actual enthalpy at 3 and 4. So yeah, we have all of our data. It's really just a matter now of finding that data and plugging it into the appropriate equations. So let's just get the property data then that we need. Then we'll just plug away. So first of all, at T1 
wet and dry bulb. We go into our psych chart. Okay. Um, I don't know that I need to put a psych chart on the board anymore. I think we all know how to use them. So we just see where the wet bulb and the dry bulb cross, and then just read off the data we need. So we get the enthalpy of 44.7 kilojoules per kilogram of the dry air. Um, we're also going to need the absolute humidity. So this is 0.008875. And this is going to be kilograms water vapor per kilogram dry air. And we're also going to need the specific volume. So, you know, again, we're going to have to estimate as best we can. Off the site chart, we get 0.848 cubic meters per kilogram of the dry air. So this is the data we would find. And again, you can all follow along on your own site charts, and hopefully you'll get exactly the same numbers that I'm using. Next, at T2, and by the way, if they just give you a temperature, in case this isn't very obvious, that's the actual temperature. That's the dry bulb temperature, right? That's just the temperature read directly off the thermometer, which doesn't have a wick on it. So if it just gives you a temperature, that, that is the dry bulb. So T2, which is really T dry bulb at 2, and the relative humidity at 2, again, into the psychrometric chart. And let's find our enthalpy and humidity data. So H2 we find to be 96.13 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. And omega is 0 0.02579 kilograms water vapor per kilogram of dry air. Um, again, I will admit that this data doesn't come directly from me reading it off the psych chart. It's a little more accurate because I have an electronic psych chart that I use, but nonetheless. These are the right numbers, at least hopefully of the right numbers. Um, and then let's find our information for the water at 3 and 4. So at T3, we'll go into A4. Really, it's A4E, right? Um, and we get that H3 is HF at T3. And this is going to be 167.53 kilojoules per kilogram of water. And we do the same at point 0.4. In the same table, H4 is HF at T4. Um, now, 33 degrees isn't exactly going to be listed in your charts, so you will have to do some interpolation. But you get 138.28 kilojoules per kilogram of the water. So this is all the data that we need. Um, now, really, it's just a matter of plugging everything into our equations. Right, so we're trying to find the rate of evaporation, which is the same as a rate of makeup water. And again, this is just MA times omega 2 minus omega 1. The equation is still here on the board from before. Um, and of course, M dot A we need to calculate. So we can't solve this one first, obviously. We have to solve it second. So we really have to do the energy balance equation now. So from the energy balance. Uh, let's just plug in the numbers. All right, so m dot 3 is given, so we have 60 kilograms per second, and then multiply by the enthalpy difference. Okay. Um, And we're going to divide this by, well, the other terms. So H2 minus H1. So 96.13 minus 44.70 and kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Um, and then we subtract from that the difference <coughs> between omega 2 and omega 1. So 0 0.02579 minus 0 0.008875. Okay, and then these are humidity ratios, right? So kilojoule water vapor, I'm sorry, kilogram water vapor per kilogram of dry air. Um, and then we multiply this by the enthalpy. So what's that? 138.28 kilojoules per <coughs> kilogram 
Again, that's for water. Right. So if everything was done properly, um, then all the units should cancel. The kilojoules certainly cancels. Um, we have kilograms of water that cancel here. Um, this is the water flow rate. So kilograms of water cancels there. Um, all we're left with is kilograms of air in the denominator of the denominator and seconds in the denominator of the numerator. In other words, kilograms per second, which are the appropriate units, and it's kilograms <coughs> of air per second. So you know, keep track of which flow streams are which. Anyway, you go through the math, and we get 35.76 kilograms per second of the dry air. Okay. Now that we have that, well, really, there's two things. First, we could find the volumetric flow rate, and then we could find the rate of evaporation. So let's just continue this here. Volumetric flow rate is the air mass flow rate times the specific volume. Um, now, perhaps to save time right now, just plug in the mass flow rate of the air from above, plug in the specific volume from the data right below that, and we get 30.3 cubic meters per second. Okay. And then lastly, the makeup flow. <coughs> well, again, the equations above, m dot air omega 2 minus omega 1. So just plug in the numbers, and we should be able to find 0.605 kilograms per second. Okay. So there would be a typical cooling tower type of problem. Okay. By the way, you look at that number and you know, that water flow rate might not look particularly high. I mean, half a kilogram per second, more or less. But keep in mind that, you know, that's like, what, a pound, over a pound each second? So 3,600 pounds each hour. Multiply that by 24 hours in a day. And all of a sudden, you've got something close to 100,000 pounds um, of water being evaporated in a day. I mean, that's a lot of water, right? So anyway, something to think about. So any questions then on the wet cooling tower types of problems? Good. Then that finishes this material dealing with air water vapor mixtures. And we are actually going to move ahead now and start talking about chemical reactions and combustion. Um, on the syllabus, um, it appears that we're about a half hour ahead of where it says we're supposed to be on the syllabus. But that's actually by design. Um, I really would like to be able to finish everything by the end of next Wednesday so that next Friday we could just do as a you know, complete day for review, questions and answers, and, and other miscellaneous stuff. So uh, I do want to talk about this today. So we begin combustion now. Okay. Well, combustion processes involve gas mixtures, and that's why we cover them here. Um, when we have a combustion process, we're going to take some sort of a fuel, and typically this fuel is going to be vaporized. So if we have, you know, let's say gasoline, uh, we're going to inject it into the engine, um, it's going to vaporize, it's going to mix with air, and it's going to burn, right? So it's a mixture. Um, if we have natural gas that we're burning, let's say in our home furnace or whatever it happens to be, well, again, we have um, a gas that we're mixing with air, which is another gas, um, and it's going to burn. And then when it burns, it's going to create a different set of gases, right? Um, in a typical combustion process, any carbon, well, assuming that the combustion moves to completion, any carbon which is in the fuel is going to burn into carbon dioxide, and any hydrogen that's in the fuel is going to burn into water. So you're always going to get carbon dioxide and water as combustion products. Um, I might also note that when we're talking about combustion, um, at least in this class, we're typically only going to be dealing with, with simple hydrocarbon fuels. 
okay? And for that matter, simple gaseous hydrocarbon fuels, you know, simple ones like methane, CH4, or propane, C3H8, or other similar ones like that. We're not going to deal with any complicated fuels. Um, many fuels, especially like fuel oil and coal, uh, there's a lot of other stuff in them, um, particularly sulfur. Um, the sulfur that burns will create sulfur dioxide, and that sulfur dioxide, when it gets into the atmosphere and mixes with water vapor in the atmosphere, actually becomes sulfuric acid. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of acid rain before. Well, it's from the combustion process. The sulfur that's in fuel will turn into, ultimately, acid rain, or it could be acid fog. Um, pretty nasty stuff, by the way. Um, also, I might note that in the real world, there's going to be nitrogen that's going to be coming along with the oxygen in the air. Only the oxygen participates in the combustion process. The nitrogen just goes along for the ride. Uh, but we might note that at high temperature, like the high temperature of the combustion process, um, the diatomic nitrogen molecules, right, N2, diatomic, um, they actually dissociate into elemental nitrogen atoms, and elemental nitrogen is incredibly reactive. It's going to actually react with oxygen at these high temperatures of combustion and form various oxides of nitrogen that we just call NOx. And this NOx, like the sulfur dioxide that's formed, when it gets into the atmosphere, it reacts with water and creates nitric acid or other acids of nitrogen. And these two will contribute to acid rain. So we understand that now. Um, and certainly, at least in this modern world of ours, um, we're trying very hard to you know, minimize pollution. We know that global warming is a problem. Um, but we're always trying to minimize pollution. Um, there's ways that we can minimize pollution, minimize these acids that are formed and all that, but that's not part of this class. Um, so just think about it for the future. Um, but nonetheless, the combustion process is important. We're going to look at a relatively simple combustion process just to make sure that we understand the basics. We're not going to worry about sulfur or nitrogen. We're not going to worry about any of these acids that may or may not be formed. Um, we're just going to deal with simple hydrocarbon fuels. Now, still, there are many fuel types, okay, um, but we're primarily dealing with the hydrocarbons. I mean, there's alcohol. Alcohol is combustible. Um, alcohol is actually mixed now with gasoline. When you buy your gasoline, it has a certain amount of ethyl alcohol, which is often called ethanol. Um, could be as high as 10 or 15 percent. It depends on where you are. Um, we're not going to worry about alcohol. Um, alcohol is an oxygenated fuel. In other words, it has oxygen within the molecule. So it doesn't need as much oxygen from the air to burn completely. Um, but that complicates our combustion process. And again, since we have all of one and a half days to deal with combustion in this class, we're not going to deal with that either. So we're really just talking about the hydrocarbons, um, coal, natural gas, oil. Um, now, oil, when it comes out of the ground, you know, we call it petroleum or we call it crude oil. Um, we don't use it directly out of the ground. It has to go through some sort of a refining process um, at a place called an oil refinery. And the oil is then divided into its parts. Um, keep in mind that oil is like a soup. Um, hundreds of different hydrocarbons that are formed under incredible pressure. And these hydrocarbons have various molecules associated with them. You have to refine it. And what you get out of the oil will be various refined products, like gasoline and diesel fuel. Um, there's also fuel oil. Often this is the heavier, more dense, more viscous material that really wouldn't flow well in a car's engine. Fuel oil will be used like for power plants. Um, so. These are what we're talking about. Also, I should note that within the category of natural gas, um, natural gas, too, is a soup. Um, in fact, deep underground, under the incredible pressure of the Earth, natural gas is a liquid. I mean, what comes out of the ground as petroleum always has gas along with it. But deep underground, it's all a liquid. Um, once you relieve that pressure and bring it to the surface, many of these fractions, remember, this is a soup, right? Many of these fractions will be vapors at atmospheric conditions. I mean, like methane, right? About 70% of natural gas is methane, and it's certainly a vapor at ambient conditions. It's a liquid deep under the ground, but bring it up to the surface, and it's a vapor. And then there's others as well, right? There's others that we know about, like propane, C3H8, and the list really goes on. Um, you know, ethane, ethylene. Uh, just a big, long list. I'm not even going to get into that list. But um, these natural gas fractions 
are what we would typically be analyzing in this particular class. Okay? We're never going to look at the entire soup. Okay? We're just going to look at the pure hydrocarbons. Um, and I might also note that we are also going to assume that for our combustion process, combustion moves to completion. Okay. So. Okay, so our combustion processes are always going to be what I'll just call complete. Um, in other words, any of the carbon is going to somehow become carbon dioxide, and any of the hydrogen is going to become water. It doesn't have to be that way, okay? If you have an insufficient amount of oxygen and you're trying to burn the fuel, well, it'll still burn, but without enough oxygen, you're not going to end up with carbon dioxide. You'll have some carbon dioxide, but you'll also have a significant amount of carbon monoxide. Um, and with the hydrogen, you know, it may not end up as H2O, it might just get to OH. Um, so there's various incomplete combustion processes that certainly apply to the real world, but again, we can't deal with them in this particular class. So this is what we're covering in this particular class. Okay. Well, with all this in mind, um, let's look at what we would just call a molar analysis of the combustion process. So combustion is analyzed using molar analysis. Um, in other words, the mass of the fuel and the air becomes less important to us than simply the molecules that are participating in the combustion process. We know that combustion is based on numbers of moles, not masses, right? If we have one carbon atom, or let's say one mole of carbon, then it's going to create one carbon dioxide. You know, if we have, let's say, two hydrogens, then that'll create one mole of water. So we're going to be, le we're going to be dealing with this molar analysis. And let's just begin with the combustion of pure carbon and pure hydrogen. So maybe I should even talk a little bit more about some of the uh, terminology we're going to use. Um, if I use the word reactant, I'm actually talking about the, well, the gases that participate in the combustion process. So this is basically fuel and air. Okay, these are what are reacting. Um, we would also have the products. So products are what you end up with, okay? So you start with fuel and air, they burn, and the products are therefore going to be, well, whatever finishes from the combustion process. So this is going to be typically carbon dioxide and water. However, there's nothing that says that we have to have exactly the right amount of oxygen to burn the carbon and the hydrogen to CO2 and H2O. Um, in fact, in most processes, we actually have excess oxygen. Um, what we find is that for combustion to really move to completion, we need to have extra oxygen in the vicinity of the combustion process, really so that the fuel and the oxygen atoms can come into contact with each other and actually burn. Um, mixing is never going to be perfect, so you can improve the chance of combustion by having excess oxygen in the combustion process. Now, if you have excess oxygen in the air, then that implies that some of that oxygen is not going to be used for the combustion process and therefore is going to be a reactant as well. So there will be some oxygen, um, you know, from the excess air. Okay. And what about the nitrogen? Well, the nitrogen is part of the air, and it's not burning. So whatever nitrogen comes in with the air certainly has to leave. And that's another one of the combustion products. So we're just going to call this N2. Right. So these are the reactants and products. And now let's look at some of the individual processes. And we'll just start with carbon. OK, so 
we have C, C for carbon. And what is going to happen to the carbon? Well, it's going to mix with some oxygen and it's going to burn. Okay. So the carbon and the oxygen are considered the reactants, right? Because they're reacting. The carbon dioxide is considered a product because that's the product of combustion. And this is what's going to happen with carbon. You can see that for every one atom of carbon, you need one molecule of oxygen, O2, in order to create one carbon dioxide. If you want to, you can even put little numbers one here just to make sure that we understand that we start with two moles and we end with one. Okay, if we look at the hydrogen, then we have a certain amount of hydrogen that's going to have to mix with a certain amount of oxygen in the air. And this is going to form water. Now here we have to be a little bit more careful. Um, if we start with one hydrogen and one O2 molecule, that's certainly not going to be H2O. Um, we're going to have to have two hydrogens. But that's not going to work out right either. If we have two hydrogens, we only need a single oxygen to form H2O. So the real balance would be this. We'd actually need four hydrogens to combine with one O2 molecule. And that's going to give us two waters. Right? And all I'm doing here is going through a balance. Right? We start with four hydrogens. We end with two H2Os. Right? We end with four hydrogens. And we start here with one oxygen molecule, in other words, two oxygen atoms. And we end up with two oxygen atoms. Okay? So these are just the simple combustion processes associated with carbon and hydrogen. Now, we're typically not going to uh, separate them out. We're, we're going to look at a particular fuel and then go through its molar analysis. So let me just show you this by example. And let's look at methane. Well, CH4 is methane gas, right? And we know that we have to provide a certain amount of oxygen. And the oxygen is always the oxygen in the air. It's O2. <clears throat> and this is going to create a certain amount of, well, carbon dioxide and a certain amount of water. So really, it's just a matter of balancing everything out here. And uh, you know, there will be some equations I'm going to give you here shortly. But in general, we should be able to look at that and, and just balance it ourselves. Just use logic here. We know that we have one carbon in methane. And therefore, it's going to have to produce one carbon dioxide. Now, if one carbon produces one carbon dioxide, how many O2s, how many oxygens do we need for that? Well, we need one O2 to burn the one carbon into carbon dioxide. So we're just going to put a little one here. That's part of our balance. And then let's also do our balance on the hydrogen. We start with four hydrogen atoms within the methane gas. Having four hydrogen atoms for the hydrogen to balance, then that means we have two H2Os. And if we have two H2Os, then that means we have two oxygen atoms, or one more O2 molecule, that had to be provided with the air for that combustion process to take place. So now we have another one. So all we really do is we balance the carbon. We then balance the hydrogen. And then we just simply see how much oxygen was needed. And that's really this right here. Right? One carbon, one O2, four hydrogens, one more O2, and that's our balance. So this is what we're going to do as we deal with combustion processes. Now, even this is not completely correct. Uh, this was just an example, um, you know, just to make sure we understood how the combustion process takes place. But now we go one step further and we say, well, wait a minute. We're not using pure oxygen with combustion processes. We're using air. So in air, we have 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen by volume, right? Um, but we also know, I mean, this is just the data that we find from our atmosphere, right? Uh, but we know that these 
volume percentages are the same as the molar percentages, right? This is something we learned when we were talking about mixtures. So these are also molar percentages, right? Mole fractions equal the volume fractions. So these are the molar percentages. So what does that tell you about the relationship between the amount of nitrogen and the amount of oxygen? Well, let's see. If these are our percentages, then in air, we have 79 nitrogens. Well, let's say 0.79 nitrogens for every 0.21 oxygens. Right? And this is on a molar basis. And that gives you 3.76. Okay. So we've got 3.76 nitrogens per oxygen in air. And again, this is on a molar basis. Yes, this is also on a volume basis. We've got 3.76 times more nitrogen volume than oxygen. But again, it's the same as the molar fractions. So now let's go back to our equation one more time. And, and let's, again, just continue this example. And in this particular example, we have methane plus. So I'm just going to leave this bracket here with a couple of openings, because that's going to represent my balance. But we know that for every one O2 molecule we have, we have 3.76 nitrogens. Okay. So this is going to be the beginning of our combustion equation. And everything on the left-hand side here would represent the reactants. So what do we have on the right-hand side? Well, quite frankly, the fact that nitrogen comes along for the ride with the air doesn't in any way change our balance, right? The nitrogen is not participating. The nitrogen is just moving through the process. So however much fuel we have determines how much oxygen we need. The nitrogen just, again, goes along for the ride. So these numbers are still going to be the same, right? We're still going to, starting with one methane, we're still going to end up with one carbon dioxide, which means we need 1O2. For the four hydrogens, we still end up with two H2Os which means we need one more O2. The big difference is that we have a nitrogen that has to be considered here as well. So the last step is that we have to balance the nitrogen. Now you can see that if we needed two O2s, then we need two times 3.76 N2s. That's what comes along with the oxygen in the air. So we have our 1 plus 1 times 3.76 N2. Okay, it's just a matter of balance. So we could rewrite this. We could write this as CH4 plus 2O2 plus 7.52N2. These are the reactants. And we end up with one carbon dioxide, two waters, and the same 7.52 nitrogens. Okay, so again, these are the reactants. These are the products. And this would be an example of a combustion equation. Now, this particular combustion equation actually has a special name. Um, not, not special because I'm using methane, but special because we're using the chemically correct amount of oxygen so that it mixes perfectly to create CO2 and H2O. Now, again, just a few minutes ago, I mentioned that that's not going to be the way of the real world. In the real world, you can have some excess air to guarantee that combustion moves to completion. But assuming that everything is chemically correct, like is done here, um, we call this stoichiometric. So stoichiometric combustion is the same thing as what I might just call chemically correct. Or you can think of it as chemically balanced combustion. Okay. In other words, there's no excess air. Okay. So again, this example for methane is actually stoichiometric. Um, I could have asked you to write the stoichiometric equation for the combustion of methane in air. And you would have written exactly what I've just shown here. 
Okay, so that's the stoichiometric equation for methane. So we will get to the case of having excess air in just a little while. In fact, it's probably not going to happen until next week. Uh, we'll see how far we get today. Um, but nonetheless, let's look at stoichiometric combustion in more general sense now. Um, again, all I've really tried to do here is make sure you understand the basics of combustion, just kind of thinking about it logically, making sure we know why we're using molar balances here, why we're just essentially finding the right number of molecules or the right number of moles of the various components. Now let's look at it um, using just general equations so that we can look at any of a number of possible combustion processes. So let's just balance our stoichiometric equation. So this is our balance. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to use A and B to represent our general hydrocarbon fuel. And A and B can be anything, right? If it's methane, A is 1, B is 4. Um, if it's propane, A is 3, H is 8. Um, you can just go into table A1 or A2 um, for a variety of gases, and you'll be able to see what the chemical symbols are for some of these various hydrocarbon gases. All right. So that is what we're going to start with. And then there's going to be a certain amount of air that's needed. And that amount of air we just call A with the subscript TH. And this is what the author likes to call the stoichiometric coefficient. And in fact, this stoichiometric coefficient, coefficient is exactly what we've been talking about when I've been talking about balancing the hydrogen and the carbon, right? Here, this 1 plus 1, that's the stoichiometric coefficient, right? Same thing over here, if I included the nitrogen in the air, this 1 plus 1, this is a stoichiometric coefficient, right? This tells me how much oxygen I'm going to need for the combustion process. So we have an O2. And then, of course, we know that there's 3.76 nitrogens that comes along. So plus 3.76 N2. And then this is going to result in a certain amount of the various combustion products. So let's say that we have X carbon dioxides. Uh, let's say that we have Y waters. Um, and then we're going to have, because we know that the nitrogen doesn't burn, we're going to have, let's call it W nitrogens. Okay. Now, again, we're not dealing with any excess air at this point. That'll be next. So there's no oxygen on the right-hand side of the equation, even though we know that there could be, and certainly will be when we talk about um, a more realistic combustion process. So this is a general equation. And now what I should be able to do is just do the balance. So let's have our balance. And let's look at the right-hand side and the left-hand side of the equations that are shown above. And why don't we just begin with the carbon? So we know that we have X carbons in CO2. That's the right-hand side. And we know that we have A carbons in the actual hydrocarbon molecule, A. So pretty clearly, A has to equal X here. Um, next, let's look at the hydrogen. Now, on the right-hand side, we have Y hydrogens. And we would note that if we have Y H2Os, then we have half that number of elemental hydrogens. Okay. Um, so in other words, if we started with B hydrogens in my hydrocarbon fuel, um, then we have to have half that number of oxygens required for the combustion process. So this would just become B over 2 on the left-hand side. And again, think about it in the context of methane. If we have four hydrogens, if B is four, then we are going to have, well, let's see. If B is four, then Y is equal to two, right? And two H2Os means we have 102, which is exactly what we were talking about a moment ago with regards to methane. 
So y has to equal b over 2. So that we know. And again, these are consistent with the example problem that I've just given you here for methane. Um, now let's look at our oxygen balance. And on the right-hand side, um, well, we have x, O2s, and then we have, well, we have y oxygens. In other words, we have y over 2 O2s. So basically, we have x plus y over 2. That's our O2 balance. Okay. And then if we look at the left-hand side of the equation, the amount of oxygen we need is the stoichiometric coefficient. So that's just a theoretical, um, th for theoretical, but it's called a stoichiometric coefficient. So here, the stoichiometric coefficient is just x plus y over 2. And we can actually plug in these numbers from above. And you can see that this is now equal to a plus b over 4. So x is equal to a, y is equal to b over 2, so y over 2 is b over 4. So the stoichiometric coefficient is a plus b over 4. And then lastly, let's balance our nitrogen in this particular equation. Um, from the right-hand side, we just have w. And on the left-hand side, well, how much nitrogen do we have? Well, we have 3.76 times the stoichiometric coefficient. So w is going to equal 3.76 times the stoichiometric coefficient, or 3.76 times a plus b over 4. And now all of these terms can be plugged back in to our general equation, our stoichiometric equation. So plug in above, and what do we get? So we have CAHB plus, now the stoichiometric coefficient is A plus B over 4, and then O2 plus 3.76 N2. And then on the right-hand side, we have X, which is A, CO2s. We have Y, which is B over 2. Whoops. B over 2, H2Os. And then lastly, we would have our nitrogen term, which is W, which is just 3.76, A plus B over 4, N2. Okay. So this is the general stoichiometric equation. And it applies to any hydrocarbon, right? As long as I know which hydrocarbon, in other words, as long as I know A and B, this entire equation now is in terms of A and B. So we should be able to go through this calculation, and yeah, we should be able to do it in a pretty simple, straightforward manner. Question? Yes? Wouldn't it be beneficial to multiply everything by 4 just so you don't have those fractions anymore? Um, yeah, but see, the problem is, I mean, it's not that you couldn't. I mean, frankly, you could multiply by any equation. I'm sorry, you can multiply by any coefficient on the left and the right-hand side, and everything's still going to be correct. Um, the problem is that if you're trying to even out, let's say, certain of these coefficients, then the amount of the hydrocarbon you start with isn't necessarily going to be so even. Um, you know, if you're trying to get nice whole numbers for A and B and all that, then, you know, you might end up, um, I mean, that'll be fine. But once you start to multiply by factors to get you know, even whole numbers on the right-hand side, then you start getting weird coefficients to the fuel on the left-hand side. So typically what we do is we always do the combustion equation in terms of a single mole, okay? one mole, one equivalent molecule, if you will. We always start with CAHB um, and move through the equation in this fashion. Okay. Now, this is a combustion equation for stoichiometric combustion. Um, what, are some of the <clears throat> what are some of the other terms we need having gone through the combustion equation? I mean, what, what is of interest to us? Well, there's a few things that are of interest to us, but for right now, the big one is going to be the air-to-fuel ratio. Okay. Um, a, F, in fact, I better use the same notation as your book does. Um, the book just 
calls it AF with no slash in between them. But by definition, this is just the air mass divided by the fuel mass. That's important to us. I mean, if we're burning a fuel, we need to know how much air we need. Um, if we know that the fuel has a certain combustion energy associated with it, um, we can determine what flow rate of that fuel we need in order to produce whatever amount of heat transfer we need for the combustion process. But we also need to know how much air we need to mix with that amount of fuel for the combustion to move to completion. So the air to fuel ratio is actually an important term that we're going to need here. And fortunately, it's not difficult to find. Uh, if we simply look at the air mass, well, we know that air, um, it's really the dry air that we're talking about. I might note that we're always going to just neglect any water vapor that's in the air. Um, not that we have to do that because we have covered air water vapor mixtures, but when we talk about combustion, any water vapor that's in the air is just going to remain as water vapor, right? It's not going to burn. It's already water. So any water vapor is just going to move right through and we're going to ignore it. It's a very small amount compared to the amount of dry air. Nonetheless, this air mass is really the dry air mass. Um, we treat air as if it were a pure substance. So therefore, its mass is just the number of moles times molar mass. Okay. And then, of course, the fuel would be the number of moles of fuel times the molar mass of whatever our fuel happens to be. So this would be an easy way to calculate. Um, now, we also can rewrite this. We know that even though we can consider air as if it were a pure substance, it's not, but we can consider it that way. Um, the air is also a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, so we could just write this as the number of moles times the molar mass of oxygen, and then plus the number of moles times the molar mass of nitrogen. So that would be an appropriate way to find the mass of the air. And then in the denominator, I guess I should note that um, we have number of moles times the molar mass of our fuel, um, but the fuel is just going to be a hydrocarbon fuel. So we could also write this as the number of moles of carbon times the molar mass of carbon in our fuel, plus the number of hydrogens, number of moles of hydrogen times the molar mass of hydrogen in our fuel. So this is uh, another way that you can make this calculation. Um, both are going to give you the same results. We should note just a couple of other things. And I think this will be about all I have time for. So if we wanted to know the number of moles of air, um, do we have that? Well, sure we do. We've gone through our stoichiometric equation. We have A plus B over 4 as our stoichiometric coefficient. We know that the air is 1 part oxygen and 3.76 parts nitrogen. So can't we just take our stoichiometric coefficient and multiply by 4.76? Right? The stoichiometric coefficient gives you the number of oxygens, so there's one, and then 3.76 nitrogens that comes along with it. So that's where the 4.76 comes from. So yes, we do know that. Um, we also know, based on data that's in our book, that the molar mass is 28.97 kilograms per kilomole or pounds per pound mole. Um, we also know that the number of moles of carbon in this equation, isn't that just A, C-A-H-B? So there's A, carbon, so that's the number of moles of carbons. The number of moles of hydrogen, isn't that just going to be B? I mean, we've got B hydrogens in our fuel, so that's that. Um, and then I suppose I might also just note that the molar mass of carbon is 12.0, and the molar mass of hydrogen is 1.01. .01. These are both in kilograms per kilomole or pounds per pound mole. Um, and then I suppose um, if we needed the oxygen and nitrogen data, you know, just 32.0 is a molar mass for oxygen and 28.0 for nitrogen. So this is all the data that you would use. And now you should be able to solve at least some of the most basic of the combustion problems, as long as we don't have excess air. But I'm out of time. So this is really just the beginning of this discussion of combustion. Next time, I'll go through an example problem. I'll calculate an air to fuel ratio for a particular type of process. 
And then we'll start looking at situations where we have excess air, and we'll look at some examples of that as well. So any last questions on this today? Thank you.